It's my pleasure to welcome today's speaker, uh, Mina Aganagic. Her title is Not Categorification from Mirror Symmetry via String Theory. All right. Um, thanks, thanks, uh, Sheldon. It's really a pleasure to um, to give this talk, and thank you guys for organizing this. It's it's um, a wonderful feature. Okay, so I'm. Am I going to share my screen, or are you going to yes, share yeah, my screen? You, you, you just go. You, you share your screen, and uh, and I will. Mine will disappear. Okay. Uh, well, let's see how this is going to work, because I. Uh, it says this will stop the screen sharing. Okay, yeah, that's good. right. It'll stop my screen All right, sharing. good, good, good. It's perfect. Oh, very good. Okay, so now I'm in control. <laughs> okay, so um, let me just see how, good. So um, I'll describe in this talk uh, two geometric approaches to not categorification problem, which come out of string theory. Um, a key new aspect and advance in both of these approaches is that um, they make manifest that decategorification, the inverse process, gives back the quantum link invariance when set out to categorify. The relation between the two approaches um, is a variant of two-dimensional mirror symmetry. And as you'll see, mirror symmetry and the tools developed by many people, including many of this audience, to study it play a, a central role. Now, um, the elements of the two approaches I'll tell you about have been discovered by mathematicians earlier. Um, there are many, many works, uh, notably by Kamnitzer and Kautis, Seidel and Smith and others. But um, physics and many techniques that we'll be using have also been discovered by mathematicians, but physics helps put them together in just the right way. So there's a third approach with the uh, same string theory origin due to Witten. So um, what will emerge from this story is a unified framework for not categorification. Um, so the story that I'll tell you uh, is subject of three papers, one of which uh, appeared um, and, and two that are coming up um, um, by this fall, and also a series of lecture, lectures at UCLA, which um, explain it in more detail than I'll have time today. Okay, so to begin with, um, let's recall some well-known aspects of not invariance. A quantum invariant of a link depends on the choice of a Lie algebra, um, and a collection of representations that color its friends. Um, to the link, in addition to the choice of the Lie algebra and representations, um, the, the invariant you get depends on one more parameter, uh, which we'll call Q uh, or, or kappa. So um, Edward Britton explained in 89 that um, this quantum link invariant comes from transonomous theory with um, gauge group whose uh, Lie algebra is, is G and uh, effective transonomous level kappa. Now in that same paper, he explained that underlying transonomous theory is um, a two dimensional conformal field theory associated to G and kappa. And in fact, for us, um, it will be this, um, we'll use that as a starting point rather than transonomous theory. So um, conformal field theory one needs has um, a fine um, Lie algebra symmetry um, obtained uh, as a central extension of the loop algebra of G, uh, where one fixes the central element to be kappa. So we'll begin by reviewing um, the relation of conformal field theory to quantum knot invariance. Um, and then we'll explain how this entire structure and its categorification emerges from geometry and eventually from string theory. Um, now, to eventually get invariants of knots in R3 or S3, uh, one uh, would start with a Riemann surface, which is a complex plane with punctures. Now, it turns out that it's better for um, our purposes to take uh, the Riemann surface to be a punctured infinite cylinder. Um, to punctures at finite points, we'll associate finite dimensional representations of the Lie algebra. And to the punctures at the two ends at infinity, we'll associate infinite dimensional Riemann modular representations, whose um, highest weight vectors are some generic weights of, of LG, not necessarily integral. Now, uh, a Riemann surface um, such as this can be obtained by suing from um, three puncture spheres. And um, to a three puncture sphere, conformal field theory associates a chiral vertex operator. 
which one can think of as an intertwiner between Raman modular representations um, associated to the ends. Um, now, to a Riemann surface with punctures, conformal field theory would associate a conformal block obtained by sewing chiral vertex operators. Now, in sewing chiral vertex operators, we get to make choices of intermediate uh, Riemann modular representations. So you end up with the vector space of conformal blocks. Um, a, a fi in finite dimensional vector space whose um, dimension turns out to be uh, the subspace of the tensor product of all the finite dimensional representations of a fixed weight. And that weight is determined by the difference of our module weights at the two ends. Now, by varying positions of vertex operators on the Riemann surface as a function of time, uh, you get a colored braid in three-dimensional space. Um, this, um, the, with it, you also get a braid invariant, which is a matrix that transports the space of conformal blocks along the braid. Now, to describe um, that transport, um, instead of characterizing conformal blocks in terms of sewing, uh, sewing chiral vertex operators, it's better to think of them as solutions to a differential equation. Now, the equation um, that they solve um, is an equation discovered by Knizhnik and Zemologico in 84. Um, more precisely, it's, it's what's called trigonometric version because our agreement surface is an infinite cylinder. Now, what's important to notice here is that this equation makes sense for kappa, any complex number, not necessarily an integer. Um, the quantum braid invariant is monotony uh, of the is monotony matrix of the Keynesian semiological equation along the path in parameter space that corresponds to this break. Um, in general, monotony problems of differential equations are hard, but this one um, was solved uh, exactly by, um, well, firstly by Chia and Kanye in 88 for SU2, and then eventually by Drinfeld and Kono in 89 um, in complete generality. And they show that monotony matrices are given in terms of R matrices of the UQ quantum group corresponding to G. Um, now the action of monotomies um, makes conformal blocks into um, a module on which the quantum group acts. And it turns out to act in the representation associated with tensor product, which is this associated with tensor product of representations um, corresponding to the punctures, um, where you view these representations as a representation of a quantum group, not of the Lie algebra, but will abuse the notation and use them, use them from both. Moreover, um, monodromy is irre acts irreducibly, is in general a block diagonal matrix. So it acts irreducibly only in the subspace of a fixed weight. And that's exactly the subspace um, that we picked out by, uh, um, by, by, by choosing um, a lambda and lambda prime appropriately. Now, um, this perspective uh, leads to quantum invariants of not only braids, but knots and leaks as well. Um, you can represent any uh, link as a closure of some braid. Um, the corresponding uh, link invariant is uh, the matrix element of the braiding matrix taken between pairs of conformal blocks associated to the top and the bottom of this picture. Um, the conformal blocks you need um, uh, for closures to get links um, are very special solutions of the Keynesian semiological equation that describe pairs of vertex operators colored by conjugate representations that come together and fuse and disappear. Um, this way, both braiding and fusion in conformal field theory play a role in the story. Now, um, to categorify quantum knot invariants, one would like to associate to a space of conformal blocks that one obtains a fixed time slice, a bi-graded category, and to each conformal block, an object of that category. To braids, you'd like to associate functors between categories corresponding to top and the bottom. And moreover, you'd like to do it in a way that recovers quantum link invariants upon decategorification. So what one typically does is you proceed, you come up with a category and then um, you work to prove that decategorification gives the invariant to set out to categorify. The virtue of the approach that I'll describe is that, um, in this one talk, <laughs> is 
is that the second step is automatic. Now, um, I'll start by uh, describing the two approaches we end up with and the relation between them in a manner that's essentially self-contained. Um, later on, I'll explain where they come from in string theory and also show that the string theory origin is the same as in Witten's approach. Now, the starting point for us will be a geometric realization of uh, the Keynesian semi-logical equation. So we'll specialize the Lie algebra to be simply laced, so it's an, of AD type. And um, the because the generalization to non-simply laced Lie algebras requires an extra step, which we won't have time for. Now, it turns out that, that the KZ equation uh, uh, for, for the uh, affine Lie algebra is quantum differential equation what's called a quantum differential equation of a certain holomorphic symplectic manifold. Um, this uh, result has been uh, proven recently by Ivan Darylenko in his thesis. Um, so for Kähler manifold, quantum differential equation is an equation for um, flat sections of a connection on a vector bundle whose fibers are homology of x over complexified Kähler moduli. Uh, where uh, the connection itself is defined in terms of um, quantum multiplication by divisors. So um, this quantum multiplication um, is, is, gives you a product on the cohomology, which uh, is basically comes from a three-point function in the sphere of uh, topological A model of X. So it comes from gramov witten theory. Um, the first term uh, is just the classical product on the cohomology. And then the subsequent terms are instant tone corrections computed by the A model. Um, just as uh, Knizia's homological equation is central for many questions in representation theory, this quantum uh, differential equation is central for many questions in algebraic geometry and also in mirror symmetry. And so what we'll be discovering here is a new connection between the two. Um, now, to get um, a quantum differential equation, um, uh, to coincide with the Knizian semiological equation solved by conformal blocks, like the ones in the beginning uh, of this lecture, um, one wants to take um, X to be a very special manifold. The manifold you need um, can be described um, as uh, the moduli space of singular G manifolds with prescribed Dirac singularities on R3, where uh, G here is a Lie group of adjoint type uh, with Lie algebra G. Uh, so for every vertex operator, we'll take a singular G monopole on the corresponding point on R. So you just um, 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 contract the cylinder into, into a line and uh, forget about the position of the vertex operator in a circle. So you get a position of the, mon of the singular, singular monopole. And, uh, We'll also play, place it at the origin of this complex. So we split R3 into R times C. So we place it at the origin of C. And we choose the charge uh, of the monopole to be um, the highest weight of the representation B. Uh, the total monopole charge of singular and smooth monopoles is um, the weight nu uh, of, the, of this total representation space that a conformal blocks transform in. Um, now, our manifold has several other useful descriptions, at least two more. Um, the best known one, um, uh, certainly to mathematicians, is um, as a, um, what's called a resolution of uh, intersection of certain slices in a fine Grassmannian energy. It plays a role in Langlands correspondence. Um, so um, this is just for us going to be a notation, and I won't explain how, where it comes from. But um, uh, anyway, so just to, to, to give some label to X. So here, this uh, vector mu encodes uh, the singular monopole charges in order in which they appear on the real line, and uh, nu is the total monopole charge. Um, um, you, you get the description by thinking about monopole moduli space as a sequence of Hecke correspondences um, of, of, of G bundles on, uh, on C. Um, anyway, so all the ingredients in conformal block have a geometric interpretation in terms of X starting with the positions of vertex operators, which are the complexified KLM moduli. Um, 
I recall that complexity of IKL and moduli are periodic, which is why our Riemann surface needed to be a cylinder. Um, now, since X is uh, holomorphic symplectic, uh, we can also think hyperkähler. Uh, its quantum cohomology is um, trivial. Unless we work equivariantly with respect to a torus action that scales the um, uh, holomorphic symplectic form with some weight. And um, we'll um, choose all the singular monopoles at the origin of C in order uh, for this to be a symmetry. Um, now, we'll work equivariantly actually with, um, with respect to more symmetries, with respect to a larger torus, which we'll call T. Uh, the equivariant parameters that um, um, for, for the lambda action, they preserve the holomorphic symplectic form and they um, are determined the highest weight vector of the Verma module. Now, um, the fact that Knizhi is the zomological equation that um, conformal blocks solve has a geometric interpretation in terms of X as its quantum differential equation also means that uh, conformal blocks themselves have a geometric interpretation. Um, solutions of this quantum differential equation are equivariant counts of holomorphic maps of all degrees um, computed by the A model on, on X where one works equivalently with respect to this big torus T. Uh, and they go under the name of given tells J functions or cohomological vertex functions of X. Um, the domain curve here um, is best thought of as an infinite cigar with a circle boundary at infinity. Um, the boundary data is a choice of K theory class, which um, determines which solution of the Keynesian zomological equation this vertex function computes. Um, it, conformal blocks of vectors and a vertex function uh, is a vector as well due to insertions of um, equivariant cohomology classes at the origin of D. And the fact that um, both the vertex functions and conformal blocks live in a vector space of the same dimension um, is a consequence of geometric satake correspondence, which identifies the covariant cohomology of X with um, um, the right weight subspace of the representation V. Um, now, the geometric interpretation of conformal blocks um, in terms of X has more information than conformal blocks themselves. Uh, because underlying normal Witten theory is a two dimensional supersymmetric sigma model with X as a target space. The sigma model describes all maps from D to X, not just the holomorphic ones. So the physical meaning of gramma wind vertex function is the partition function of a supersymmetric sigma model on, uh, with target X on D. Um, so in the interior of this infinitely long cigar, you have A type twist, and at the boundary at infinity, one, one places a B type boundary condition. Now, um, boundary conditions form a category, and the category of boundary conditions for our sigma model on X, uh, which preserve B type supersymmetry, and where um, um, working equivariantly with respect to T is um, the derived category of T equivariant coherence she used on X. Now, if we pick as a boundary condition an object or a brain uh, of the derived category, uh, we get the vertex function as its as um, as the partition function. Um, a priori, it depends on the choice of the brain only through its charge, only through its K-theory class. Um, now, since Knizhian zomological equation is the quantum differential equation um, of X, the action of the quantum group on the space of conformal blocks uh, has a geometric interpretation as the monodromy of the quantum differential equation of X along the path and its scalar moduli corresponding to the break. Um, a priori, the action of modern monodromy um, uh, comes from the action on the K-theory class of the brain at the boundary at infinity. So it only knows about the charge. So uh, you get the action of the UQ quantum group on a covariant K-theory X. However, the sigma model needs an actual brain to serve as a boundary condition. So, the action of monodromy has to come from the action on the brain itself. Um, now, along the path in Kaelin moduli, the derived category stays the same, of, of coherence, stays the same. So um, 
um, brain group that acts uh, on the brain on the brains uh, like this is an auto equivalence of the derived category. <clears throat> now, from the sigma model perspective, the monogamy problem um, arises very concretely as follows. Uh, by letting uh, the modula of the theory vary according to the braid in the neighborhood of the boundary at infinity. So if you think of a tip of the cigar being at S goes to infinity, the boundary at S is equal to zero, you can take the modula to vary over, over, over some short interval. Um, the directional um, along the cigar coincides with time along the braid. Now, um, by asking how monodromy acts on the quantum state produced um, by the path integral over the cigar at S is equal to one, one gets a very phase type problem. Um, the exact kind of problem that was studied 20 years ago by Chakotay and Bach. The solution of, to this problem is a linear map on equivariant K theory, the monodromy of the quantum differential equation, which acts on the K theory class of the brain. Uh, so, Mina, we've been accumulating some questions, and I'm wondering. Oh, if I'm not seeing them. I think what, what happened with the screen sharing is I'm actually not seeing any questions uh, at all. So, just when would be a good time uh, for you to pause for me to read some of the questions? So um, well, well let me finish this, and uh, in a couple of slides we can we can pause. Okay, okay. it's okay. unfortunate I'm not seeing the questions. Um, yeah, that's that's fine. I'll, I'll take care of it. Just you just tell me when you want to stop. All right, great. Now, uh, the path integral depends. Or that's not difficult to show, it depends only on a homotopy type of the path of V through, uh, through the moduli uh, near the boundary. So one can take all the variation to happen in a very small neighborhood of the boundary, keeping the moduli constant of the, the entire cigar. So this produces a new boundary condition, uh, so a new brain, which is the image of the original one under this derived equivalence function. Now, consistency of these two descriptions one, uh, simply um, uh, monodromy acting on the, on the K-theory class, monodromy of the, of the quantum differential equation, and one uh, saying that this K-theory class is the class of the brain we get at the boundary, uh, says that action of grading on equivariant K-theory by a monodromy of quantum differential equation leads to a derived autoequivalence factor of the, of, the, of the derived category. Now, this is actually a physics reinterpretation of an extremely hard theorem um, hard to prove theorem by Bezrukovnikov and Okunko, which uses methods and characteristic P. Um, now we can go further and uh, extract monodromy matrix elements, as for just monodromy matrix cells and elements themselves. Uh, to do that, um, you cut the infinite cigar uh, near its boundary, say um, at s is equal to one, and insert a complete set of brains. Now, Path integral of the sigma model with a pair of B-type brains in the boundary where time runs along the annulus computes monodromy matrix element um, uh, of, the, of the braiding matrix or um, monodromy of the quantum differential equation matrix um, where um, which matrix element will that one picked out by the brains. The same path integral can be reinterpreted in a different way by thinking of time that runs around the around cigar. And thinking about it that way, it computes the index of the supercharged Q preserved by the two brains. Now, the homology of the supercharged Q is, per definition, the graded home space between the brains computed in the draft category. Um, so, so, so far, we understood that the derived category of T equivalent coherent sheaves on X manifestly categorifies the braiding matrix elements. And then the next natural question um, is to ask, um, well, you should naturally expect that it should also categorify uh, quantum uh, link invariants because they can also be expressed as um, matrix elements of the braiding matrix between pairs of conformal blocks. All right, so now it's a good time to stop. So tell me what the questions are. It's tragic that I don't see them. And that, that's fine. So the, um... The first question is to ask if we can interpret the braiding and fusion operations of the Verma modules in terms of the tensor excision property of factorization homology for a coefficient system on the module category of UQ of the Langlands dual, perhaps by understanding the embedded colored links as a certain thread. So I explain, I explain how we understood braiding right now, and I'm going to explain how we'll understand fusion. 
Okay. okay. And I think that this understanding is new. So, um, well, um, you tell me. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, next question is, is lambda a lattice inside a maximal torus? Uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, lamb, lambda is a lattice inside a maximal torus of G. That's right. Okay. And a big then, lambda. Okay. And if this is an A twist, so gromov witten theory, why are we using the boundary conditions for the B twist? So this is an infinitely long cigar. Remember, the whole game in the work of Chikori and Vafa was the fact that by using, by taking very, very, so what an infinitely long cigar is going to do is um, it's going to project you to supersymmetric vacuum. And the supersymmetric vacuum is consistent with any supersymmetry bound preserving boundary condition. So even if you chose an A twist in the interior, a B twist at the boundary is perfectly consistent with it. Okay, so. Okay, thanks. <laughs> we had uh, one more question in the chat. Is, is the correspondence between vertex operators and monopoles in R3 coming from a certain setup and string theory? If yes, can you please say a few words about the setup? Um, I'll, the string theory setup will be at the end. So I'm, I'm going to explain that. Okay. Well, one more question just came in. Can we? So know? I should say that um, originally this was discovered by simply computing partition functions of say supersymmetric gauge theories, understanding how they come up from string theory and then noticing the connection with conformal field theory or Q deformations of conformal field theory as you'll see when we get there. Yeah. Okay. So one new question just came in. Can one relate these monodromy matrix elements to stable envelopes? Uh, yes, but they are, uh, these guys are, are, are yes, the, that's right. Okay. In cohomology OX, that's right. Okay, well, that's all the questions I have now. So all right. thank you. <laughs> okay. okay, so <clears throat> now, so what we'd like to do now is understand what it tells us about link invariance. Uh, for this, we first need to understand which brains in the Dirac category correspond to conformal blocks where pairs of vertex operators fuse to trivial representations. Now, in looking for such objects, uh, we'll also discover that not only braiding but also fusion has a geometric interpretation in the Dirac category. So for this, we'll need an additional important insight that's, that's contained in our sigma model interpretation of conformal blocks. Now, in general, uh, one can have more than one braid group action on the Dirac category. In general, braid group uh, Dirac equivalences are generated by some Fourier Mokai transforms, completely abstracted. Um, now, the sigma model origin of our theory spells, spells exactly which Dirac equivalence function we're getting. Um, so, by the, by the origin in the sigma model 2x, the functor comes from variation of stability condition on the Dirac category with respect to central charge function which is a very close cousin of the vertex function that computes conformal blocks. Uh, the vertex function generalizes the central charge in two different ways. Firstly, it's a vector due to insertions of cohomology classes at the origin. And secondly, it depends on T equivariant parameters, on equivariant parameters of T action on X. We can undo the first generalization by simply placing no insertions at the origin. And we'll get a scalar analog of the vertex function, which uh, we'll call the equivariant central charge. So it's a map from equivariant k theory of x to c. The central charge function that provides the stability condition on the Dirac category uh, is obtained from this one by setting the t equivariant parameters to zero. So in particular, it's computed by ordinary gramov witten theory. Uh, the stability condition derived, uh, defined with respect to this, this central charge is known as the pi stability condition discovered by Douglas. Now, while it's computed by gram witten theory, we also know that the X being uh, holomorphic symplectic or hyperscalar if it's smooth, also receives no quantum correction. So in fact, the Z naught, the, central, the pi stability central charge, which usually um, receives terrible instant time corrections and it's very hard to control, is in fact a completely classical object. And if I had time, I would have written down the formula for it. So the setting uh, provides uh, a, a source of examples for bridge lip stability conditions, which should be wonderful to study. Um, in fact, um, the original reason why physicists were interested in studying vertex functions not under this name is because they compute generalized central charges or central charges. So exactly the construction we did 
if we didn't work with this equivalent with respect to T, it would have given us um, a set of chart <coughs> in ordinary sense uh, of the you know, big mirror symmetry book, for example. Uh, now we can uh, we return to understanding how derived category categorifies link invariance. Now, one of the early lessons uh, from mirror symmetry is the geometry of X um, near a place in its moduli where this develops a singularity is reflected in the behavior of the central charges. In fact, that, that's how we study mirrors, <laughs> the A model, right? Um, okay. So for us, central charges are close cousins of conformal blocks. So behavior of conformal blocks must be reflected in the geometry of X. Now, as a pair of vertex operators approach each other, one gets a natural basis of conformal blocks obtained by suing parallel vertex operators as follows. Uh, that's called the fusion basis. Now, possible choices of fusion products are label, labeled by representations that occur in the tensor product um, of uh, those associated with the vert vertex operators. Now, a basic result in control field theory is that fusion diagonalizes braiding. So in the fusion basis, braiding acts diagonally, as you can see from this picture, um, unlike in the basis that we started with in, in the beginning of the talk. Now, corresponding to a pair of vertex operators that come together is a limit in Kalin modulo of X in which it develops a singularity. And one can show that um, the reason it develops a singularity is that there's, it develop, there's a whole collection of vanishing cycles, which are labeled by representations that occur in the tensor product. If you study monopole moduli spaces, this phenomenon is closely related to monopole bubbling phenomena. Or rather, it's, uh, it's origin. Um, these vanishing cycles give rise to objects of the derived category whose vertex functions have the same leading behavior uh, near the singularity as conformal blocks in the fusion basis. Now, conformal blocks, uh, well, every brain will give you a solution of Kishnik's homological equation in conformal block. You can't get any conformal block from a brain. So conformal blocks, which diagonalize the action of braiding, do not in general come from actual objects of the derived category. Eigenschiefs of braiding on which the braiding functor acts just by uh, cohomological and equivariant degree shifts are rare. It's also one of the lessons of mirror symmetry. Um, so instead, uh, what you get is a filtration on the derived category where the terms in the filtration are labeled by distinct representations in the tensor product. Um, the brains in the m uh, term in the filtration come as close as possible to being eigenschiefs. They have central charges um, that vanish at least as fast as the dimension of the corresponding vanishing cycle. But in general, they contain terms that vanish faster. And uh, their order of vanishing increases as m decreases. So um, now braiding, which exchanges a pair of vertex operators, corresponds to a generalized flop in the geometry. In the simplest case, if we studied A1 with spin one half representations, we would have gotten an ordinary flop that's familiar. But generally, we'll get generalized flops. The flop is generalized because more than one cycle vanishes. And in general, the cycle that vanishes are not spherical. Now, by analyticity of the central charge function, one gets actually a pair of filtrations one uh, on each side of the flop. Uh, the braiding preserves them because it has the effect of mixing up objects of a given order of vanishing of central charge with those that vanish faster and belong to lower orders of defiltration. This is again informed by mirror symmetry. Now, <clears throat> uh, okay. Now, uh, on the quotient, um, sorry. Ah, okay, there's a slide missing. On the quotient categories, um, the braiding functor acts um, at most by degree shifts. So in the quotient category, you treat as zero all the objects that come from, um, from the denominator. Uh, uh, so because the braiding preserves the filtration on this quotient categories, uh, subcategories, it acts at most by degree shifts. And these degree shifts can be read off from equivariant central charge. Um, 
and these are very central charges that these scalar cousins of conformal blocks. So you can read it off explicitly, uh, where D, uh, where D is the dimension of the vanishing cycle. And, uh, and then there's a term that keeps track of the equivariant central charge, um, uh, the, the, equivariant, the equivariant degree shift. Okay. So you can actually get explicit predictions for what, uh, what derived equivalences do. And in the, the, there are not that many examples where this is actually understood, for example, for cotangent bundles of Grassmannians. And it reproduces exactly what mathematicians have discovered by much more difficult methods. Anyway, um, so the existence of this filtration is the geometric and um, uh, categorical origin, <laughs> turning things around, of the statement in conformal field theory, the fusion of adenylized rating. Now, derived equivalences of this type uh, um, have been um, thought about by uh, Roquier and, and Chang, and they call them perverse equivalences. So this gives a source of examples of perverse equivalences, <laughs> perverse is the name, I guess, <laughs> which come uh, from geometry and from physics. Okay, so now uh, we can characterize brains whose um, vertex functions are conformal blocks uh, that we need to, to get link invariants um, to cap off the braids. So uh, a cap colored by representation V comes from um, a pair of vertex operators colored by conjugate representations that approach each other and fuse to identity. Once they fuse their identity, uh, they can just disappear. Um, now, objects of brains of the derived category that correspond to such conformal blocks belong to the very lowest term in the filtration. Um, so they're necessarily, they have nothing to mix up with. So they're necessarily eigenshapes of the braiding function. So the braiding acts on them at most by degree shift. Now, even so, uh, they're very, very special ones for the same reason that identity representation is a special representation in representation theory. Now, associated to the identity representation in tensor product, uh, where uh, we take Vs to be minuscule representations, this co constraint to minuscule representation is for X to be smooth, as opposed to a manifold with singularities that you can't resolve. So, when V is a minuscule representation, uh, the corresponding vanishing cycle, uh, corresponding to the trivial representation in tensor product, is known as the minuscule Grassmannian uh, of uh, the maximal parabolic subgroup of G corresponding to V. Um, and in the simplest case um, of, uh, of, um, uh, of SU2 with spin a half representation, this will be just a P1. Um, uh, or SUM with, um, okay. with, with K fantasymetric, it will be um, Grassmannian of K planes in M dimensional space. Um, when, now, when a collection of vertex operators come together uh, in pairs of minuscule representations and their conjugates, our manifold uh, has a local neighborhood where we can approximate it as a cotangent bundle to a product of minuscule Grassmannians. And we get in this, uh, a very special brain, which is a structure sheet of the vanishing cycle. A uh, brain which simply uh, is supported on this product of minuscule Grassmannians. And among other things, the vertex function of this brain is the conformal block that corresponds to this picture. Now, for these brains, uh, the bi-graded homes uh, with um, action, any action of braiding automatically um, uh, um, give braid, braid invariants whose other characteristic is the link invariant. Okay, so they automatically categorify the link invariants, and they are automatically braid invariants. What's not automatic is that they're also link invariants. So that the homology group themselves are link invariants. Now, using very special properties of these brains, um, analogous to the fact that identity representation is a very, very special representation, one can show that uh, this homology, certainly at the physics level, it's a, it's a, it's a proof, um, uh, and it's a sketch of a proof in math, that these homology groups uh, categorify the corresponding uh, um, quantum link invariant. Okay, so the, the, the homology groups themselves are link invariants. 
Now, an elementary uh, but new consequence of this approach is a geometric explanation for uh, mirror symmetry of, uh, of, link in, of quantum group link invariants. So this mirror symmetry statement is that an invariant of a link and its mirror image are related as follows. So if you uh, reflect the link, you also change Q to Q inverse and the invariant stays the same. That's a well-known fact from transcendence theory. Now, in this approach, um, this mirror symmetry of links is a consequence of Sarah duality, which is um, of the, in the derived category, which is isomorphism of Q cohomology, which brings F and G at the two ends, and Q cohomology obtained by reflection that exchanges the, the endpoints. And here uh, you get a shift of the um, equivariant degree, which, uh, sorry, first, you get no tensoring with a canonical uh, class of X because, uh, because uh, X is uh, hypercalic, so canonical bundle is trivial. However, you do get a shift um, of the equivariant degree because um, while um, the canonical bundle of X is, a uh, line bundle of X is trivial, uh, its unique homomorphic section is not invariant under, under, under the torus section. Okay, now, um, so starting we, with we, the seven- We've had a few questions, we've had a few questions come in, so maybe you could take a uh, time to break and take questions. Give me just a second. Could, yeah, so, well, I, I just need uh, one, set, one, one minute and then we'll, so, so starting with Saturday duality, uh, taking all the characteristics of both sides and using the definitions, one finds indeed um, that uh, the corresponding um, link invariant satisfy mirror symmetry. Now, the fact that Sarah duality implies mirror symmetry is not an accident because the direction along the interval, which gets reflected um, in Sarah duality is exactly the, the direction along the link that gets reflected to get the mirror link. So it's built in, uh, in there in, this, in the alpha. Okay, now what were the questions? I'm sorry, I muted myself. Um, <laughs> So a uh, couple of questions from uh, Jin Gu. Uh, so can refined non invariants via refined Chern Simons or refined topological strings be categorified into this geometric picture? And uh, also fusion of a dual pair into the identity has a geometric meaning. How about the general fusion product? Uh, sorry, uh, no, all, all the fusion products, questions. sorry, all the fusion products have a meaning in terms of, so um, the, the manifold develops singularities and these singularities um, give rise to filtration on the derived category so that somehow the category breaks up. In, so the, 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 what you might have expected, right, is that somehow you can analog of the fact that fusion diagonalizes braiding is that you can find some bases of say brains in the derived category, which are eigenshapes of braiding, okay? So that you can't have, okay? Um, at most, Brains that live in the bottom term in the filtration are actual eigenshapes, okay? But you get this filtration, which has as many terms as the terms in the tensor product, and uh, where basically characterization of what the filtration is can be read off from conform field theory. Okay, thanks. And then we have a uh, question from Greg Moore, um, that you, uh, when you claim that the Hamm spaces are uh, invariant, not invariants, uh, do you prove this by checking uh, uh, invariance uh, up to quasi-isomorphism under Reidemeister moves? Yeah, so you can argue that it satisfies the Reidemeister moves. And uh, the, the, so it's not a math proof, um, but it's a physics proof. And it says that um, um, you want need several steps. So firstly, uh, you use crucially um, the existence of these filtrations where um, the properties of the brains and the fact that um, well, it's a, it's a bit of a long story, which is described either in the first paper that I wrote or in the, my first lecture at UCLA, at the very end of it, 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 it gives a sketch of the argument, a short one, okay? Um, but yeah, it, you can show that it, that it satisfies the right of Mr. Moves. And um, the, the tight link between this perverse filtration and conformal field theory um, tells you why you should expect um, that the right of Mr. Moves be satisfied. In other words, so some degree shifts have to, basically what happens with these derived equivalences is if that um, if, the, if the degree shifts are trivial, then, then certain equivalence is just identity. And these are the kinds of things you need to show that, um, and um, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you, that's all the questions we have for now. Okay. All right, now 
mirror symmetry gives us a second uh, description of homological knot invariance. And while I'm separating the two stories into two separate ones, they were really discovered in parallel. I, one wouldn't have discovered one without the other. But anyway, the second description is based on the equivariant mirror X. The equivariant mirror is a lambda gisberg theory with target Y and potential W. Now, the ordinary non-equivariant mirror of X um, would be, um, because X is a hyperkähler manifold whenever it's smooth, it's ordinary non-equivariant mirror would be another hyperkähler manifold, which is to first approximation, though not exactly, hyperkähler rotation of X. Now, as X has, has only Kähler but no complex moduli due to T equivariance being posed, Y has only complex but no Kähler moduli turned on. Now, a description based on Y would give symplectic geometry approach to the not categorification problem, where the derived category of coherent sheaves is replaced by its homological mirror, an appropriate category of Lagrangian brings on Y. Now, at the moment, one knows how to obtain from Y only a homological link, symplectic homological link invariance, which captured the theory of Q is equal to one, such as those in the works of Seidel and Smith for quantum mold. Um, now, there is an alternative symplectic geometry or uh, based approach where the dependence of the theory on Q, instead of being a mystery, is manifest. Now, the key fact is since we're working equivariantly with respect to um, this, um, uh, C-star action that scales the holomorphic symplectic form. All the relevant action um, about the geometry of X comes from the fixed locus of the C-star action, uh, which is a holomorphic Lagrangian in X, we started with, uh, which I'll call its core. Now, the terrible notation here, which <laughs> does not work in talks at all, is that we have two things which we call X. So we'll call the original X, the big X, and the new X, its core, the small X, <laughs> okay? In particular, it's half the dimension. The small X is the half the dimension of the big one. So it's justified. All right, now, viewing the big X as the moduli space of monopoles on R3 with this kind of split, its core, the small X, is a locus in the monopole moduli space where all the monopoles, both singular ones and, and the smooth ones, are the origin in C and at points on R. Now, instead of working with the big X and it's mirrored the big Y, one can work with the core X, uh, and the small X and the small Y, um, the, the small Y being the core of the mirror. Um, so working, because working equivariantly with respect to this uh, C star action on X, the bottom row has as much information about the geometry as the top. You lose nothing. Now, while the small x embeds into the big x as a holomorphic Lagrangian submanifold um, of half its dimension, um, the uh, little y fibers, sorry, the big y fibers over the little y with holomorphic Lagrangian C star fibers. Now, for example, uh, if we take uh, the big x to be an A n surface, uh, its core um, uh, small x uh, looks like a, a, a sausage. <laughs> like this, and um, its mirror uh, Y is a C star vibration over the big Y is a C star vibration over the small Y where the small Y looks like that, okay? And the small Y is mirrored to the small X. So these two things are mirrored to each other. Now, uh, in this case, uh, the small Y is a single copy of the surface from the beginning of the talk where uh, with marked points where the C star vibration degenerates. So mirror to a vanishing P1 in X, remember X is this um, kind of sausage like thing, mirror to a vanishing P1 in X is a Lagrangian in the small y that begins and ends in the punctures. And uh, they are projection of Lagrangian spheres in the big y. Now more generally, uh, uh, the equivariant mirror of the big X and the ordinary mirror of its core, the small X, um, is Y, uh, which, uh, which is a symmetric product, appropriate symmetrized product of uh, the Riemann surface where conformer blocks live with some locus deleted. 
Now, projection to the common SYZ base of the X and the Y is the same, the small X and the small Y, is the same as projecting the big X, the moduli space of singular monopoles in R3, down to, um, down to just R. Uh, so you have just points moving along the, the, the line with some um, special points where the singular monopoles are. Now, including the t equivariant action uh, um, on the big X and the small X corresponds to adding uh, to the sigma model on the small Y a specific potential, which is a multi-value holomorphic function on Y. Um, the potential, which is a multi-value holomorphic function on Y, is a sum of three types of terms, uh, all coming from um, equivariant actions. A term that comes from the, um, the action that preserves the holomorphic form and that uh, told us what the weight of this Raman module is at the, at the origin of the, um, at the zero at infinity. And two, which come from uh, the C star action that scales the holomorphic symplectic form. Now, <laughs> mirror symmetry predicts that conformal blocks uh, of the affine Lie algebra, um, the ones we started to talk with, um, are partition functions um, of the B twisted theory. Uh, I don't know why the notation here changed. It shouldn't have. <laughs> uh, partition functions of the B twisted theory on the long cigar with A type boundary conditions with the B twist in the interior and A type boundary condition at infinity. An A type boundary condition is Lagrangian in Y. Now, such amplitudes uh, have the following form. So the uh, integrals uh, of um, uh, over the Lagrangian of the holomorphic form, the top holomorphic form in Y, the lambda Gisbert potential enters like follows, and then in general the insertions of, of some chiral um, uh, ring operators for insertions at the origin of the cigar. Now, what we are discovering here is from, from mirror symmetry is integral formulations of uh, conformal blocks of the, of the affine Lie algebra, which goes back to works of Fagin and Frankel in the 80s, and also Schechtman and Vartika, and is very well known to mathematicians. Uh, now, there is a reconstruction theory due to given Tall and Telemann, which says that starting with genus zero data, and more precisely with solution of the quantum differential equation, one gets to reconstruct all genus topological string amplitudes of any semi-simple two-dimensional field theory. And this one certainly is. So a B-twisted lambda Gisbert model um, uh, on, uh, on, um, we have uh, uh, with, um, and the A-twisted sigma model on X working equivalently with respect to T are expected to be equivalent to all genus. So you get an all genus equivalence of topological string amplitudes. Of a, of a manifold, which is the big X, and a manifold half its dimension. Now, um, corresponding to a solution of, of the KZ equation is an A brain at the boundary of at infinity. This brain is an object uh, of the right Fukai-Seidel category of A brains and Y with potential W. Now, the objects uh, of the right category are graded Lagrangian, where the graded Grading is by the mass of grading and additional gradings that come from the non single value potential. Now, these additional grades can be derived, defined uh, in the same way you define the mass of or cohomological grading by lifting the phase of uh, now this generalized homomorphic form to a real valued function on the Lagrangian. Okay. Now, in general, uh, to formulate a category of A brains on a non compact manifold such as Y requires work to cure non compactness. And um, there are some choices you have to make and so forth. Now, in the present case, we are after symplectic geometry-based approach to knot homology. So Lagrangians we need uh, are all compact because they're related by mirror symmetry to compact vanishing cycles on X, on the big X. So for such Lagrangians, there is no issue with non-compactness of Y and the superpotential W wouldn't have played any role either where it's single value. So for us, W isn't a single value, and its main effect is to provide additional gradings on the um, on, uh, on floor cohomology groups. Now, um, we're not quite done. So mirror symmetry helps us understand exactly which questions we need to ask to recover homological knot invariance from Y. Okay. Um, now, since Y, the small Y, 
is an ordinary mirror of the small x. Um, to understand how to recover homological knot invariance from the small y, one should first understand how to recover homological knot invariance from small x instead from the big x. Now, every B-type brain on the big X, which is relevant for knot theory, comes from a, a, a B-type brain on the small X by a push-forward functor. So this functor simply interprets a brain on the small X um, as a brain on the big X. <laughs> um, now, this functor has an adjoint that goes the other way that takes a, a, a sheaf on the big X to a sheaf on the small X by tensoring it with a structure sheaf of the small X and restricting to the small X. Um, the fact that these functors are adjoint and they exist is what lets us relate computations on the big X to computations on the small X. Now, given a pair of objects on the big X that come from the small X, the homes between them computed upstairs in the derived category of the big X agree with the homes downstairs on the small x in the derived category of the small x only after replacing f, uh, the brain that, uh, that gave rise to the brain upstairs, the brain downstairs that gave rise to the brain upstairs by a funny thing where you start with the brain downstairs, push it up and then take it back down. So you can't simply forget, you can't simply forget about this, um, this, this push pull functors because if you do, the equivalence does not hold. Now, by mirror symmetry, for every pair of objects on the big X that come from the small X, like this, there is a pair of Lagrangians on the small y, which are mirrored to F and the G, the B brains on the small X. And such that uh, the, uh, this, the homes computed on Y agree with the homes computed on the big X. Now, these functors um, uh, that uh, relate objects on the small y and the big y, um, they relate them in a way that mirrors, um, in the, the mirrors the corresponding functors on the, on the, on the b-type side. And construction on these functors and parallel understanding of mirror symmetry upstairs and downstairs is joint work with Shenden and McBrain. Now, mirror symmetry and these functors let us trade any question in the upper left corner and the derived category of the big X to a question uh, in the lower right corner of the derived category of A brains on the small y, giving us a definition of equivariant homological mirror symmetry. Now that we, we got uh, equivariant topological mirror symmetry, mirror symmetry of topological string amplitude, essentially if afraid. But this one, one has to work a little bit harder for the homological one. Now, so now recall our example. Um, oh, uh, okay. Why? Um, uh, the small y, which is an equivalent mirror um, to the big X, big X being the A in service. Now, uh, mirror to I, ordinary mirror to I vanishing P1 in the small x is a Lagrangian in y, which look in the small y, that looks like this interval. We had this before. Um, now, mirror of the big X is y, which would be what's called a multiplicative A in surface with a certain potential, which we don't need. That, but this multiplicative A in surface is a C star vibration of the small y. Now, the functor that maps Lagrangian downstairs to Lagrangian upstairs is simply um, uh, taking the Lagrangian downstairs and pairing it with an S1 fiber over it. Okay, so the functor up is sort of the obvious one. The functor that goes the other way down does not send the vanishing sphere upstairs back to the central brain. Instead, you can compute it either from mirror symmetry or from the definition by Lagrangian correspondences. What you find is a figure eight Lagrangian. Uh, the interval and the figure eight Lagrangian have essentially the same K-theory class, but they're different objects in the, in the derived category. Um, the basic virtue of the pair of adjoint functors is the, uh, the fact that one preserves the homes is not difficult to see, okay? You can see that um, that, for example, self-intersection of, of a Lagrangian sphere has rank two, here are the two points, and the intersection between these two Lagrangians, um, uh, Lagrangian sphere is a point, and here is the corresponding point downstairs. And it's quite crucial um, to, do a, to do this business, otherwise you'll get all the ones wrong. 
Now, the example we just gave is relevant for construction of covenant homology because um, the big Y would be, can be described as symmetric product of copies of an AM surface, or more precisely, an open subspace in it. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this, um, this symmetric product of AM surfaces is the same geometry inside that Seidel and Smith use um, in their work on um, symplectic covenant homology. Now, the corresponding lambda Gisberg model uh, has a target, which is also an open subset in the symmetric product of the surface where the conformal blocks live with a specific potential. The objects corresponding to the top and the bottom are Lagrangians that look either like the intervals for the bottom or the figure eights for the top. And then to get a non-trivial link, you start by transporting the Lagrangians, say the ones at the bottom, along the non-trivial braid and braiding, for example, that, that, that twist this pair of points will do this to the Lagrangians that started out with simple intervals. Uh, next, the generators of the floor coaching complex are simply the intersection points of the Lagrangian graded by the Maslow index and the new grading that comes from the, um, uh, the non-single valued potential. So the homological linking variant is just the floor cohomology group whose differential is obtained by counting homomorphic disks of Maslow index one uh, uh, on Y, just as in floor theory. Now, the condition that the disk being Y requires that the W be single valued around the boundary of the disk. So the equivariant grade of the differential is zero. All right, now the other characteristic of the resulting theory is, um, simply counts intersection points. So this is a formulation of a theory. You can compute anything you want from it. It's, it's actually not that very difficult. Um, but um, uh, the other characteristic simply keeps track of intersection points um, is a sum over the intersection points, keeping track of the grading. Now we, one lands with a specific prescription and what's amazing is that it turns out that this prescription for computing the Jones polynomial, of course, you have the full categorical theory, but this prescription for computing the Jones polynomial alone um, uh, is uh, actually due to Bigelow. So one gets a proof that this theory categorifies Jones polynomial. All right, so <laughs> in the remaining time, which I don't have, I was gonna explain where this comes from string theory, but I don't have the time, so. Um, well, thank you, uh, Mina, for a great talk. Okay, uh, we can now um, switch to uh, questions and uh, and answers. You can raise your hand in the participants window. I see uh, Greg Moore has a question, uh, so uh, please go ahead, Greg. Um, so, Mina, maybe, maybe this is in your in your relation to string theory section. But um, so I just would like to try and relate this if possible to uh, the way I like to think about some of these things. So as you know, um, you, can, you can formulate not homology in terms of categories of eight brains in a landau ginsberg model on monopole moduli space with a, a certain super potential, which looks vaguely like the ones you were writing. Um, can you explain I, the relationship of that to the, you know, the kind of web formalism for that landau ginsberg model and uh, for, for constructing the Fukaya Seidel category? Okay, so um, any um, naive approach to getting, uh, recovering covenant homology from uh, the lambda is, they were, okay, well, where Greg is getting at, uh, is that um, there, there is a very similar potential that, um, that uh, Davide and Edward uh, Witten, um, Davide Gaiota and Edward Witten uh, wrote in their um, in the beautiful 2011 paper. And, uh, and then um, there's a, a big beautiful machinery for, uh, which involves a lambda Gisbert model with a potential. And then uh, there's been a um, sort of a big, uh, beautiful machinery that, um, that Greg with uh, Edward and Davida developed studying uh, categories of A-brains in uh, lambda Gisbert models. And um, an approach which is uh, somewhat different than uh, the, the, uh, the one that uses Foucault's Seidel theory and they explain the relation between them. Okay, now, um, so, um, uh, that's that, that's that's wonderful. The the thing is that um, to understand how to uh, how to recover uh, homological not invariance from 
the lando Gisbrook potential that, that, that was written down in those papers is very similar to this one. It would not give you, to the one that I wrote, it would not give you mirror symmetry. There's one term. It would also all, actually also not give you conformal blocks, not, not honest forms. There's one term. Uh, the, the, the difference is actually uh, essential in, in part of physics. Oh, wait, so, wait, wait, wait. Um, can I, can I, can I, please. Uh, if, I could, if I could interject. Gaiato and Witten actually wrote several superpotentials. Yes. So uh, there's. Dima, this... Dima and I showed that some of them do not categorify not homology, but my impression up till now has been that the one they wrote on monopole moduli space using the scattering matrix formalism was actually valid. Are you saying it's not true? Um, well, uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, the, uh, it's, it's, uh, the, so what one was, what one wants is uh, one wants to write down a potential on the, on the mirror of the big X, on the potential uh, on, on, uh, on the big Y. And uh, they write down a potential on the big Y, which, um, which could potentially uh, be the right one, given by mirror symmetry. Um, and uh, that is an interesting question, which, uh, which one should study. It's a, uh, in some ways, uh, I mean, uh, you see, the, the approach that, that, that you guys developed with, uh, um, with the scattering amplitude is it's wonderful. It works very well for thimble brains, okay? Now, the thimble brains are important, um, but they are, if you Sorry, want a geometric, a, if you want the geometric approach to the problem, Mina, they're not Mina, the right, Mina, they're not Mina, the right kinds of brains. Mina, um, Mina, Mina, slow down. <laughs> Mina, it works very well for thimble brains. Is that what you said? So it's it's based on the the, the A brains, which are thimbles, right? Um, well, when, they, uh, so they Greg, the, um, let me let me say it differently, okay? What this story develops that I'm telling you about is a geometric approach to the problem, okay? Uh, now, once one has this geometric approach, there is going to be a different one, which is algebraic. This is actually well known in the, you know, there are many people who have thought about this. Um, and many, many, people. this is a very, very old story, okay? Um, so with the approaches that I told you about, develop geometric approach. Once you have that, you will ask the next question. Can we get an algebraic approach? An algebra because basically um, both the derived category of coherent sheaves and uh, the, 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 the category of, of, of Abrams uh, in this lambda Gisbrook model um, that, I, that I wrote down um, are actually going to be uh, describable as derived categories of modules of some algebra, where you lose the geometry and get just representation theory. Except you want to do it in that way where um, once you you first understand the geometry and then you do representation theory, which just becomes you know, we put stuff on the computer and that's that's that, right? So I do think that um, that the story that the approach that you wrote with uh, with 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 um, with uh, um, uh, Alan and Edward, that that will be part of this algebraic story, and uh, and I, I think that may not be actually too far off to just making this completely explicit. Um, but I, I think to to really, the, there are many pieces of the story that are completely crucial that were not anywhere there in your, in your works. Firstly, to describe braiding, you have to work with the derived category. You have to be able to mix up brains and anti brains. You, you actually have to work with, um, you know, brains that are described as complexes. The re this figure A is actually a complex of, of symbol brains and a very specific one that you can derive from mirror symmetry, right? It's, you, you can't just make some kind of games where you play a little bit of kind of K theory and we think of it as a vector space. And you actually need to do the right categories. There's no way to look at a verification without, without the right category. There's just not. Wait, so you're saying that the Fukaya Seidel category is... You have to do the derived for kind yeah, of category. I don't really understand what you're saying because you can certainly have a you certainly have a degree shift in the category. You have to, so to, to actually compute so, individual homes, yes. 
But for like, example, the brand that you need. Um, right? Linear combinations with the Grisha. Mm -hmm. So I don't really understand what you're saying. Okay, I, I, I could Maybe not. we should talk about it offline. Sure. Okay. Right. So, so we have uh, another question from uh, Andy Nitsky. Hi. Hi. Thanks, that was great. Um, uh, so you, you talked a lot about a formulation of conformal blocks as like disk amplitudes in some very specific uh, two-dimensional theory. Mm -hmm. um, and if I understand right, the kind of disk amplitude you mean is what Chakoti and Vafa would call like the topological limit of the disk amplitude. Ah, except you don't need to take the limit. Right, so, so what do you get? You get um, Andy, the, the key thing in this story is that, um, so this was actually in the original paper of Chikadi and Vafa as well, is that um, these disk amplitudes actually solve these equations exactly, not approximately and not in any kind of limit. You don't need to take a topological limit. What you do need is you need to have what's called the flat coordinates on the moduli space. And if you look at the appendix of Chikadi and Vafa paper, um, I think it's uh, the TT star paper, okay? Um, the characterization of this, the explicit characterization of these flat coordinates is given. And the, flat, the, the construction of the flat coordinates and the importance in studying lambda Gisbrook models goes back to the works of, of uh, Dagra, Verlinda, and Verlinda, right? So the statement is that the silly positions of vertex operators are the flat coordinates of the lambda Gisbrook model. And because they are the flat coordinates, you can actually, the, 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 um, the, you get an exact solution, not in any of, you don't have to take any limits. There's nothing approximate whatsoever. Let me ask, maybe I can ask it in a slightly different way. Um, in, in, in the Chakoti Mapa stuff, there's two different connections that, that kind of play a role. There's the, there's the connection that gives you the quantum differential equation, which is in the story of, in the theory of Frobenius manifolds. But then there's the TT star connection, you know, that what Shakoti and Vapa call the improved connection. Yeah. So, so th they explain that if you take if you study a very specific basis of both the chiral operators and the coordinates on the moduli space, then you will get this. Um, the uh, I think this is the the Robin type. The Robin type of. Um, so basically, the Del Bar operator uh, that they had trivializes them. That you. It's, if, you, if you want the, the, the specific characterization of these coordinates, it's given in the appendix of Chikari Vafa paper. Um, and uh, and it's, it's quite magical, because in general, if you just write on something, it's not going to solve those equations exactly. And this does. But, well, OK. Uh, OK, thank you. Are there any further questions? Uh, please raise your hand in the participants menu if you have further questions. Uh, yes, uh, we have a question from Asan Khan. Hi, um, so I was wondering if you mentioned at some point that you only restrict to uh, brains that are images of, uh, that, that are in some sense compact in your target space. Uh, do, they, do these brains generate the entire Fukaya Seidel category? Um, they'll generate a compact part of it. Can you not get um, uh, non-compact brains by taking, some, in some sense, uh, infinite, uh, infinite direct sums of these brains? Um, okay, you can also work, as, sorry, infinite direct sums. Um, no, uh, you, you can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, not in any precise sense that I know. I mean, they're just simply compact. Um, so I'm, okay, I'm a little bit fast here, okay? The way one saw, the way this was discovered was like this, okay? One understood that equivariant mirror symmetry is important. So the first question you wanna ask is I wanna understand equivariant mirror symmetry for C. Mm -hmm. The target on the, on, the, on, the, on the original side, which is just C. How mm -hmm. hard it is to understand derived category of coherent sheaves on C, it's not very hard, okay? Yeah. Do we understand mirror symmetry for C? We do. Can we yeah. do it equivariantly? Yes, we can, okay? Mm -hmm. And so then you understand that first and you will understand the, uh, you know, you, you'll, under, you'll understand exactly what the fact, you know, how the brains are graded and how the, the homes between the, 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 you know, coherent sheaves on C, which are very simple, right? Um, yeah. Get reproduced by the Landa-Gisberg model, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, and, uh, and in, in fact, you understand a, a bigger story, but, but there, um, because the brains are not compact, you, uh, you have to do something to regulate, to, to, to make sure that, uh, that, uh, that, um, uh, um, that the floric cohomology is well defined, so that on the small you know, motion of the brains, you don't lose intersection points. Okay, and what one does in both math and physics is essentially the same. Now, um, and in that context, you can also understand how you know how the story that um, how the the, the 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 specific uh, categories of brains that um, that, um, that, uh, that written and, and, and Kayoto and, and, uh, and, and Greg um, used arise and um, and so forth. Uh, and then you're on the then you you start asking about okay and surfaces and you build up the whole thing. When, so it's not that one doesn't need to understand anything else. It's just that I'm I'm trying to keep the story simple. Okay. But, yeah. So in that uh, in the in the and, simplified. And in, fact, in, in fact, right. Uh, um, there's, there's really a beautiful story here for the A and surfaces, for example. The derived category of, of coherent sheaves is actually a category of, of modules of representations of a quiver. And you can understand, you know, what these restriction functors do there. You can understand, you, you can understand how the quiver representations arise from the categories of A brains. There's, you know, uh, so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, it's just a so a follow up about the simple example that you talked about with the target space being C. Um, so in that sense, it's known uh, in that example, it's known that uh, the um, so on the B side you have uh, you can have the space filling brain and you can have a Dirichlet brain at a point, right? So yeah. one of them is mirrored to a compact uh, Lagrangian, and one of them is mirrored to a non-compact one. Yeah. But you can show that either one generate the category. Yeah. So. Uh, you can get, in other words, you can get the non-compact brain by taking, in some sense, infinite sum, sums of the compact brain. Uh, so it's uh, it it should it should be uh, it should suffice to just consider the compact brain as long as you allow infinite infinite sums. But uh, yeah, I guess that's uh, I can I can talk about the details later. Um. Uh. Well. Uh, just a second. Um. Okay, I don't remember exactly, but for example, this theory has very funny features. Mm -hmm. The first time you see it, homes between many ordinary looking brains look, in, are, the home spaces are infinite dimensional. The first thing right. you want to do is say, okay, th this is actually finite dimensional, I'll just cut it off by hand. And you can't do that because, the, the, because there's a reason why the home spaces are infinite dimensional. They have a gradient and that regulates us. So yeah. this is, uh, so I also, I do want to say something in, in um, uh, we, we, <laughs> the, the Lando Gisbert paper that I, is, is, should be out in, in months, so anyway, but um, in, in, in the, 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 the Gaiota and, and Witten paper and also Greg paper with, with Gaiota and Witten and, and Moore were huge influences that I, I saw, they, they certainly helped tremendous amount in this work. Right. Mm -hmm. um, however, they did get one thing wrong. Uh, if you want a philosophical point, but an important one. Mm -hmm. The point that, it, that, they, that, that they were making is that basically any category of brains with the right kind of things is going to work. And I don't think that that's true. Uh, I think that the story is as crisp and as sort of the right setting is as unique as it was in the Witten's original Transimus paper. Precisely the point in his original Transimus paper was that there are all these different math constructions that the physics picks out just the right one. And I think string theory here picks out just the right one. Um, and the things that come out from string theory come out with just the right coefficients. If you ask just you know, the right question, it will tell you exactly which lambda is what potential that you get. Uh, there are two, for example, very similar looking ones, which arise from two different limits in string theory. One that Gaiot and Witten wrote, and the one that's needed here. And this one is the right one and not that one for a good reason. For example, that one arises by a certain symmetric limit. If you start from three-dimensional gauge theory, there, there's sort of many different ways to go down to two dimensions. Um, the one that they use is sort of a symmetric limit, which treats the Kiggs and the Coulomb branch symmetric. And that turns out not to be the right one. The right limit is what's called, uh, I think, a uh, Coulomb branch limit, maybe, um, where it's only the Coulomb branch that's kept. Mm -hmm. so, okay, yeah, the Lando Gisbert description of the Higgs branch instead. The one that I wrote here. 
Okay, uh, we have uh, another question from Aslan Balasubramanian. Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, am I audible? Uh, yeah, yeah. You are. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. So my question is about the relation between the uh, quantum differential equation and the holomorphic symplectic manifold capital X. Mm -hmm. So is there such a relation for any holomorphic symplectic manifold? Like in particular, can it be singular? Does it matter if it has a resolution or not? And, and in fact, people studied it uh, generally for Kähler manifolds, right? Um, what's the, this homo the, the, the hyper Kähler setting is nice because um, you know, if you turn off the equivariant action, all the instantons are gone, and they're only there because the instantons are there, uh, because because you turn on the equivariant action, and it's nice because of connection with representation theory, uh, which is which is uh, which is somehow I think the origin of all the different connections of with representation theory of these geometric things, even. So, but yeah, you can it makes sense for any Kähler manifold. The thing is that the A model works automatically in terms of the flat coordinates. And in the lambda Gisberg model, you have to work to get to the flat coordinates, to find the flat coordinates. But the A model somehow, um, it's originally written in terms of flat coordinates. In fact, you have to work to get any other non-flat coordinates, as Eritan explained in his papers. Okay. Are there any uh, further questions? Well, if not, let's thank Mina again for a wonderful talk. Thank you, Mina. And uh, we'll meet again uh, next week. Uh, Greg Moore will be the speaker. I refer you to the WH uh, CGP website uh, where we have the titles and abstracts and uh, together with slides and videos of previous talks. So thank you and see you next week.